and welcome to the Illinois Learn to Hunt podcast. I'm Jason Buckley. On today's episode, Dan and I head out to Riverbend Wild Game and Sausage Co. outside of St. Joe's, Illinois, to talk to owner Chuck Stites about deer processing and tips for hunters on handling meat in the field. Dan Admin Curtis will then go over the hunting report and giving us an update on what they've been seeing in the woods, as well as an update on all open seasons. And then we'll close out the podcast with some critter trivia. All right. Well, let's get to that interview with Chuck at Riverbend Wild Game and Sausage Co. So today we're joined by Chuck Stites, who is the, the owner of Riverbend Wild Game and Sausage Company here in, in St. Joseph, Illinois. Uh, thanks for joining us today on the podcast, Chuck. If you give us just a, a little bit of background about who you are and kind of how you got started in, in deer processing. Yeah, well, it's good for you guys to come and uh, visit us today. Uh, I started out as a, as a hunter, and growing up, we did our own butchering of deer as well as beef and pork from the farm. I got a job in graduate school working at the Meat Science Laboratory at the University of Illinois, which was a meat slaughter animal processing plant. And I managed that place for, ended up uh, 30 some years. And during the time that I was working there, folks asked me if I could make sausage for them. and. Uh, about that time we moved out here in the country where we live now and I decided to go ahead and get set up to, to do some deer processing for hunters and our business has just taken off from there uh, mainly word of mouth and having good products and good services we've, we've grown over the years sure that's great yeah so Chuck I was just wondering for people I know growing up a lot of the butchers I went to were people who were doing it out of the back of their house, kind of getting started. And then you have the whole facility here now, which is awesome. But how would you get started in butchering for deer? Because there are some places where it's kind of a guy doing it out of his garage. Well, that's how I started also yeah. here. And I knew how the facilities needed to be because of working at the university in an actual slaughter facility. And so I, I set my facility up to meet those types of standards. Sure, sure. Mm -hmm. uh, however, uh, a person that's just starting out, the the main thing is to um, you know kind of just start out within your meats. Uh, start slowly with the types of things that you know how to do, and that might be that uh, you know beyond you know first you know you've got to have a, some type of facility, a place that you can keep clean and sanitary, so that you're producing wholesome product. But most generally, people would start out just by you know cutting deer and generating the cuts, you know the steaks and roasts and that kind of thing. Maybe they would just bag up the trim or box up the trim, and the the person would take it to another processor for for the processing and the ground products or sausage and things. Or maybe you would get a grinder and be able to grind venison as burger and package that might be the place that you start out sure you know it's take minimal investment on your part you'd be able to with a fairly minimum amount of training you can put out a, a decent product and then you know grow from there as you become uh, more familiar with the process as you generate more income then maybe you can afford to expand to other equipment uh, better equipment you know other areas of your business such as making sausage or jerky or those types of things mm -hmm. sure I, I guess I, I have kind of a, a quick follow-up you know not not everyone who listens to this podcast is obviously going to be coming at it from a perspective of I want to become a deer processor but a lot of them might be you know looking into to trying to identify a deer processor in their area so taking that a few steps further you, you talked about you know a little bit of the, the process a little bit of the equipment and the facility that you need to have to you know provide that that wholesome product what are some of the things a, a new hunter should be looking at if they go to, to visit a new a new deer process what are, are some of the things they should look out for are there accreditations or credentials uh, to, to look into could you just kind of speak on that sure there are a variety of processors that you may may find uh, as you mentioned earlier somebody working out of their garage uh, as a hunter I would try to find out as much information as I can about that operation as I can. Visit the local sporting goods shops and see if they've heard anything good or bad about them. 
if you've got other friends and uh, hunting buddies that have taken your meat, their meat there, uh, find out what their experience mm -hmm. was. Uh, and then once you've kind of settled on, okay, this looks like a place that I may want to go ahead and take a deer to, you know, when you come there, just just like you would any restaurant or uh, you know grocery store, you know, look to see is it look like it's sanitary? Sure, Does it sure. have any off odors? You know, is there you know something that just doesn't seem right? Um, is the the processor when they t accept your deer, do they they seem like they're uh, above board type of uh, person and above board with a more above board? Uh, operation are they able to answer your questions that you have and you just got to do an evaluation then you know you take a deer to them and see how kind of experience you have and then you'll know from the next time well do i want to bring more there or do i want to keep looking somewhere somewhere else sure that's, that's a great idea just to you know like like you mentioned just talk to other hunters and see what their experiences are because <laughs> there's not really a, a better I guess review of, of a product or of a processor than somebody who's who sampled their product and has had their their deer taken there. So that's definitely a great great tip. Yeah, and I'm sure if you don't know anyone who hunts, you can go online and find reviews anymore. Almost everybody has at least if they don't have a website, they have a review somewhere. Sure, maybe sure. a Facebook page yeah. or something like yeah. that. And then also when you go to a processor, they may also be a licensed uh, processor for beef and pork mm -hmm. and you can kind of get a feel for how they do with, you know, if you're buying retail products at their store, do they do a good job with that? Uh, and you can probably rest assured that if they're doing a good job with their beef and pork sure. in their inspected <laughs> facility, they're probably going to do a decent job with uh, venison also. Sure. Great point. Yeah, now now I guess we'll, we'll kind of dive into some, some more you know, technical type questions uh, that, that a deer processor's, you know, feedback, I, I think is very interesting. I know personally, I've, I've had a question ever since we kind of had this idea to come sit down with you. I've had this, this singular question in the back of my head, and it is, what is the, the easiest or best method you have found for removing silver skin off of venison? Because, you know, oftentimes it can be slimy, it can be a little tough, and if you try to fillet it off too quick, you might, you know, ruin some of the meat and you can keep a lot of that, that meat on the silver skin. So have you found a, a technique that, that you found very good at, at you know, removing that, that silver skin? Or do you choose to leave it on? I know some people do like to leave it on just for, you know, freezer burn protection. Well, that silver skin, uh, if you're cooking a piece of meat using moist heat cookery, that's going to break down meat. If you're going to dry roast something, then yes, that silver skin can be uh, something that's not quite as appetizing. Sure. It's going to be a little bristle. <laughs> and the best thing is is to have a sharp knife. Uh, a lot of people, if they're going to do that, will use their fillet knife that they use for fishing. Mm -hmm. you know, it's good and sharp, and it's flexible blade. Um, there are ways of filleting fish where instead of scaling the fish, you take the skin off. Kind of like a catfish or? Mm -hmm. Well, I think of a catfish as you kind of pull that off with a pair of pliers or something. But with a uh, with the way I'm talking about, you've, you've taken the meat loose on a fish from the, the backbone, mm -hmm. the ribs, and then you lay that fillet skin size down on the table. Mm -hmm. Then you take your knife, generally like from the tail side, and you just kind of, push down towards the table and slide that knife right along the top edge of that skin, removing that skin from the fillet. Mm -hmm. And that's the same thing that we do when we remove the silver skin from the loin. That's the main thing that we take the silver skin off of is the loin because back towards the, the rear part of the loin, the part adjacent to the hind legs, that can be quite thick. Mm -hmm. And just laying that loin down with the silver skin on the table in contact with the table and then grab a hold of the end of that silver skin and a little bit of meat and just take your knife and just run it along the table kind of while keeping tension with your other hand you know kind of pulling away oh, sure. so you're kind of pulling and pushing in opposite directions to to take that silver skin off and you may need to kind of 
rock your knife back and forth just a little bit to facilitate that, that cutting. And a six inch fillet knife is, is plenty long to do that. Uh, really, that's about the only silver skin that I would find that I need to take off on a, uh, on a piece of deer meat. That's interesting because, you know, talking to, to a lot of hunters, everybody removes every little bit of silver skin. So that, that's interesting that, you know, you brought up the fact that if you're cooking it in like a crock pot or something, that's a lot of times just going to render out. Right. And that silver skin is mainly collagen. And if you are thinking of like a stew uh, or a, uh, you know, a soup that you, know, you want to be thicker, you know, when you cook that collagen, you cook that connective tissue that kind of gelatinizes in there and it, it does make for a, a thicker uh, you know more well-rounded you know not thin type sure. of type of dish and with that collagen also when you're making sausage it can improve the the eating quality of that sausage to limit you can't make sausage out of all connective tissue <laughs> but um, a little bit you know the amount that you would get off of a normal deer that you're going to take off in that batch of sausage is going to be fine you know when I say when I say a batch of sausage I'm thinking more you know commercial size not you know the guy that's going to take the silver skin from one loin and throw that in with other meat that he's got that he's going to make two and a half pounds of sausage <laughs> in his food processor no, I'm not talking about that right. uh, but you know the, you know, in a 25 pound batch, in a 50 pound batch, you know, the, the amount of collagen that you're going to get off of that silver skin in the sausage is going to be perfectly fine. Interesting. Yeah, I really don't remove too much silver skin when I get my, my cuts back for cooking, but where I did have a lot of interaction with silver skin was not from your processor, Chuck, but from another one, I got back jerky meat and every piece of little jerky meat, whatever they gave me, the I had silver skin on it and I spent about three to four hours at the kitchen table because the first time I did it I was like well we'll see how this turns out and I didn't take it off and it was basically a meat gum and then uh, the second and third time I, I went through that bag I went and I uh, spent a couple hours sitting there filleting just like he said like a fish sitting there filleting all that silver skin off and uh, it was meticulous but it came out good but man you, you, when you're making jerky with it anyway you got to make sure you get it off or else you're going to be chewing it yeah yeah yeah, yeah that's that's correct if you're going to make jerky if you don't remove that connective tissue it is going to be gristle yeah you know, you're going to chew up the meat and then you're going to have this wad of connective tissue sure. that you're still yeah. chewing on <laughs> positive was i didn't share it with anyone <laughs> negative was i had a lot of meat gum to chew through <laughs> So for new hunters, they're, I think they're really kind of worried about field dressing deer. It's going to be their first hands-on experience dealing with deer meat. So I was just wondering if you had any do's and don'ts when it comes to field dressing. Um, what are some things you've seen that are, are a no-no and some things that are actually helpful to you when, you when you get a deer in here? Well, the process of field dressing, uh, the reason for it is so that you can take this meat, which is at an elevated temperature, you know, it's body temperature of 103, 104 degrees, and you need to get that cooled down to what we think of as a safe holding temperature of meat, which is 40 degrees Fahrenheit or less. And so I, what we do is remove the internal organs during field dressing to one, take that potential source of contamination from the intestines out of, away from the meat, and also, by taking away all of that uh, internal organs, we've removed an awful lot of heat from that carcass and allows us to go ahead and put some ice bags in the internal cavity to start cooling that, that meat down. And that's, that's the reason that your field dressing is for sanitation of the meat and to facilitate cooling down of that carcass. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I've heard, especially when it comes to, to cleaning out the carcass after field dressing and the, the use of water, I've heard several people say, you know, they never touch water. They never let water enter that carcass because, you know, again, water is known to, to create bacteria. That's where bacteria can, but is, is it is equally important as, you know, maybe you nick the intestines and you have some fecal material in that, that gut 
carcass still. Is it important to, to rinse that out or can you get by without using water? I would like to look as an example to a meat processing plant that processes meat for sale, beef and pork, poultry, turkeys, any of that. They use a lot of water. You know, they're, once they remove the hide from the from the animal's carcass, they're going to be rinsing the outside of that carcass. When they remove the intestines and the heart and the lungs and all of that, before it goes into the cooler, they use a lot of water to rinse out any potential contamination from that carcass. So for you to think that by using water on your deer carcass is something that's going to be bad, well, what could it hurt? Sure, sure. You know, what we're doing is, as you mentioned, is we're, we're cleaning out that internal cavity of that deer. And if anything is going to need to be cleaned out, it's going to be the internal cavity of a hunter harvested game animal. Because most of the time when you take that shot, you're going to be shooting into the body cavity of that deer through the ribs, through the lungs, through the heart, uh, heaven forbid through the intestines, you're going to be introducing contamination from the outside of that animal, you know, out in, from whatever's in the environment, into what would be a sterile environment in the muscles of that meat. Or you're going to disrupt the internal organs and, you know, in the case of digestive tract especially, you've got a lot of bacteria that are both good and bad that may be in that intestines that you're now going to introduce in contact with the meat. So as soon as you can get that field dressed and as soon as you can get that rinsed out with potable water, the better. And one thing that I would like to kind of follow up on the question that we just talked about, about the field dressing. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I see so many hunters that come in here that have not been prepared for the harvest. They prepare for the hunt, but not the harvest. They go out and they scout, they use trail cameras, they practice with their uh, archery equipment, practice with their rifle, they've got set free clothes, they've got all these gadgets and goodies, but oftentimes they have the excuse of Oh, I didn't have a good flashlight, so I really couldn't see what I was doing when I was field dressing the deer after dark. Mm -hmm. Or I didn't have a sharp knife, or I didn't have whatever to, to keep that shark as clean. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so it, you know, you're you're harvesting this this animal, you know, for a trophy and for meat, perhaps, or for meat or a trophy, perhaps. Why not prepare for that? Mm -hmm. And it doesn't take much for you to get two or three bags of ice, <clears throat> put in a cooler, have in, your, in the back of your truck in case you harvest a deer. If you don't, you go home and you put the ice back in the freezer until the next time. So that way you've got something to start cooling that deer down. You can get some, you know, very inexpensively, you can get gallon jugs of water or you can rinse out some milk jugs at your home and put water in that so that you've got potable water to rinse that, that carcass out. You can very easily buy you know high quality LED flashlights that are head mounted mm -hmm. or otherwise mm -hmm. that give out great amounts of light and there you can buy the cheap ones at any sporting goods store or Menards or whatever. So you know, there's really not much of an excuse why you can't be prepared for the harvest. Another thing that you can do to prepare for the harvest is there are a lot of videos on the internet now that, you know, those didn't exist when I was a kid growing up. Sure. Yes, there's some good ones and some bad ones, but take a look at a few uh, videos online, how to field dress a deer and you can, probably figure out which ones are, are good <laughs> and which easily, ones are yeah. bad. But you know, that'll be a way to educate yourself or have somebody that knows how to field dress your deer, have them show you. Mm -hmm. 
That's a great tip, I, and I, I do kind of want to want to circle back and highlight the, the the fact that you hit you hit really hard potable water, and I just kind of want to want to reemphasize that. You know, Chuck's not talking about going down to the creek next to where you your your buck lays and and using that water to to clean out the carcass, but having that that fresh potable water uh, to be able to do that is is definitely a, a great tip and is is definitely needed. So another problem that people might think about when after they shoot the deer is how much time they have to get it to you before rot sets in and so what are the conditions for rotting meat and how can people prevent that from happening the conditions for rotting meat is going to be one contamination you know contamination of the meat with bacteria or other spoilage organisms and also temperature anything above refrigeration temperature above uh, 41 degrees you're going to have some level of spoilage start to occur it's going to occur a lot faster at 80 or 90 degrees when it's warm out than it is when it's you know 17 degrees when you're you're hunting but you know the main thing is to get that carcass cooled down get it cleaned and get it cooled down as an example it takes like 36 hours for salmonella bacteria to double at 50 degrees temperature. Mm. So it's not something, you know, and salmonella is a, is a pathogenic bacteria that is often present in, in, in the intestines of meat animals. So if you've got, you know, temperatures above 50 degrees or right around 50 degrees you've got a little bit of time but you know the difference of uh, well let's, let's say if you don't recover your deer until the next morning you shoot it in the evening and you don't recover it until the next morning it's not uncommon for some of that meat in the thicker portions of the carcass like on a big buck kind of in the sh the inner parts of the shoulders or the inner parts of the neck or the inner parts of the, the hind legs for that stuff to start to spoil. And Just because of the heat trap? Because of the heat. Interesting. And it's and it's not necessarily because of contamination from the shot. It's just that by not having that meat get cooled down, it will develop a, a really sulfury, thick, funky type an odor most of the time it's just going to be in the deeper parts of that muscle and you can go ahead and you can smell it very easily when you open that up and you can trim that that area out and the rest of the the meat may be perfectly fine and you'll find that it may be you know that the part of the animal that was not laying on the ground is fine, but the part that was laying on, you know, next to the ground, that part has kind of gotten spoiled because of the, just because of the body heat. So that's why it's really important for you to, as soon as you get the animal harvested, you get it field dressed and either get it into a meat processor where they can put it in a cooler or into your own cooler or get it put on ice so that you can get that, that carcass, you know, cooling down. When the temperatures outside is you know 40 degrees or so, you've got you know the better part of a day probably to get it someplace. It's not like you got to rush out there and get it done in an hour. But the longer you go, the more chance that you're going to have for some types of uh, spoilage. Sure, mm -hmm. sure, and that you know that that comes back to the the emphasis you know we at the, the Learn to Hunt program put on proper shot selection and proper practice you know because obviously like like you mentioned the, the longer that carcass lays out there the the more risk of, of meat spoilage and so having you know that that practice to ensure you can take the most ethical humane shot you can and ensure that that quick harvest is, is going to benefit you a lot so once a hunter gets their deer and they uh, field dress it and clean it out and they get it cooled down they're going to bring it to a meat processor if they're not processing it themselves and they bring it here and then the processor might say okay what cuts would you like and if it's a first time hunter, you might not have looked into different types of cuts of meat, they might not have an answer for them. So what are some common cuts that uh, you would provide someone and kind of like their usages? So people might know what to ask for when they show up to a processor. 
Well, you probably first you need to know what the processor offers because not all processors may cut up the deer the same. Some may do things boneless, some may make some cuts bone in. So you need to find out what their what their process is. Most of the time on a deer, the tenderloins, which are the you know, like the filet mignon mm -hmm. that you if you're buying beef, you know, that muscle that lays on the inside cavity of the body from the ribs back towards the hind legs, you know, the tenderloin that's gonna be very good. You know, that's gonna be pulled out probably whole when you're gonna be able to dry roast that. The or cut it up as medallion and saute it. Oh, so good. However, you, you know, you would, you would cook, you know, similar types of cuts of meat uh, as a beef or a, a pork type of cut. Then you've got the loin, which is some people call the back strap, straps. Some people call it a tenderloin mm -hmm. too, but it's the two muscles that lie on either side of the backbone, you know, running from the back legs up into the where the shoulder blades are. That's gonna be, you know, very good, very desirable cut of meat. Then you've got the back legs. There's, you know, if you're doing it boneless, there's three main muscle groups on the back legs that can be used for roasts or steaks. You know, some of the, the inside leg portion is generally a finer grain and more tender than the outer leg or the the quadriceps muscle, which is kind of the, the top part of your thigh. You know, those are gonna have more connective tissue, uh, but you know, they're very good if you want you know, things cut as roasts, or if you're gonna make steaks, you need to use some type of moist heat cooking, like if you're making Swiss steak or stew meat or something like that, you can use those arms. The shoulder is generally not some place that you're gonna be able to get you know, true cuts of meat out of because of your shot. You know, most of the time when you, if you're accurately shooting at that animal and making that, that accurate shot, it's going to be somewhere right there in the shoulder area. And your arrow is going to penetrate through there. You're going to have some blood clots that may be there. You have, may have some contamination that need to be trimmed out. If you're shooting it with a rifle or a shotgun slug, you may get some bone breakage and things like that that just disrupts that tissue that makes it not something that you're going to be able to get steaks or roasts out of. By all means, if you you know get a shot that is is late, leaves those front shoulders um, intact, you know they make good roasts too. But most processors aren't not going to offer the shoulder as roasts or steaks because few deer come through with those areas of the carcass intact. Sure. Uh, some people like to have, uh, you know, if you, if you like lamb shanks, or you could have, you know, deer shanks, you know, also, but that'd be something that, you know, if you're as a, as a home processor, you know, you could do those, you know, do that yourselves. The processor that you take it to may or may not offer that as, as a cut of meat that you want. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, that's just something you need to, to find out. Some of the cuts of meat, like if you were thinking like beef or pork and you're thinking like sirloin chops or sir sirloin roasts and uh, you know, rump roasts and, um, you know, back ribs and things like that. On a deer, some of those cuts of meat aren't really that big and they're when the processor cuts though that deer carcass some of those portions are going to be included let's say in the leg roast and things and so you know making sirloin chops from a, a deer just may not be feasible you know when you get into an elk larger size sure. animals then you, know, you can have you know a good sized uh, sirloin steak just like you would from the beef and most processors probably are not going to offer the ribs just because they're again of the cleanliness and sanitation of the field dressing process that few deer come through that that rib cage on the inside is 
pristine and clean yeah. like you'd want if you're going to be saving the, the ribs. However, if, you know, you as a, as a home processor, if you take good care of your deer, get it rinsed out properly, as, as Dan mentioned there earlier with pot, potable water, then there's no reason why you can't go ahead and save ribs for yourself. But as most, as a rule, most processors aren't going to offer that as a, as an option. Sure. So, you know, you can get, you know, whatever cuts of meat that the processor offers that you would use in your normal way of cooking. And if you don't eat roast, well, it may not be worth for you to have somebody, you know, the processor cut roast out of the back legs because you're just not going to use it. Mm -hmm. You know, have them make it into steaks or make it into ground product burger or other sausages and things like that. But, you know, most people, if they want cuts of meat from the venison, they're going to get cuts from the loin and the tenderloin. That's going to be the, the most desirable. And then, like I say, from the back legs, if they want additional roasts or steaks. Sure. I, I like the way you put that, that a lot of it depends on how you as as you know your household your family whoever you're cooking for how you normally use that you know a red protein and you can substitute venison in a lot of your traditional family recipes right there and, and have a, a pretty good meal but i do want to highlight the the, the front shanks that you brought up um I, I know i grew up we we processed our own deer and every single year that front shank would just get tossed into a grinder turned into burger whatever but I, I have started to, to take more care and actually cook those shanks like asabuco and things like that. And I tell you what, there's a lot of flavor packed into those those front shakes. Um, been really impressed with those those lately. But okay, well, Chuck, do you have any other tips or suggestions for new hunters or current hunters that you've seen through your work? I would say that probably the the biggest tip is what I mentioned about you prepare for the hunt, I'd like you to also prepare for the harvest. And if you're going to take that deer somewhere to be processed, you need to find out how they want that deer meat coming to them. Some processors may only take in boneless meat to make sausage. So if you showed up with a carcass, they may not be able to help you. Or if that processor wants all the deer to come in skinned and you come in with one with the skin on it, that processor may not accept that carcass from you. And likewise, if you bring in a skinned deer to a processor that wants the skin left on it, you know, you're going to have issues there too. You also need to prepare for if you are going to harvest a trophy animal and want to have that uh, deer mounted as a shoulder mount or a head mount for use by a taxidermist, make that decision and prepare for that ahead of time. Find out if, you know, you know, do some looking around, do some investigation, find out where are you, do you want to take that uh, deer to get mounted? What taxidermist do you want to use? Find out how they want that head to come into them. Do they, do they want it already, the hide completely removed from the bones and just they want the, the hide and the antlers? Do they want um, the head with a certain amount of neck left on there? Do they want the whole hide? Do they want a portion of the hide? There again, you know, prepare for that harvest just as you would um, preparing for the hunt. So we, we talked about, I guess you kind of brought up this idea of, you know, being prepared for the harvest. And one thing I, I've seen a lot the, the past few years is it seems like everybody's looking for a, a way to get their, their game home. Um, whether it's, you know, they went out squirrel hunting or, or upland hunting or turkey hunting or even deer to some extent. And people have, have really seemed to gravitate towards using, you know, black trash bags or, or different just household bags that they may already have. Can you can you kind of speak to that and if that is an issue? Yeah, if you look at trash bags, most of the time on the box, there'll be something on there about it's not food grade, that it's made from recycled materials. Uh, a lot of the trash bags nowadays have got scent on them, which if you put meat in there, then it's gonna pick up that 
some lavender scent to yeah, like a breeze or something. Yeah. Lavender scent, yeah. odor control, whatever type of sure. thing that's on there. So, you know, if you're if you're going to take the meat to a processor, they're probably not going to accept any meat that comes in trash bags or Walmart plastic bags or grocery store plastic bags. Ziploc bags are abundant in any store you go to that would sell any type of food packaging and they're they're made out of food grade material and they're inexpensive so a lot of our customers will bring their boneless meat in uh, Ziploc bags those vacuum sealers are cheap enough mm-hmm. now that um, if you want to vacuum package your 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 cuts of meat if you're processing it yourself or trimmings that's going to go to the processor you know those aren't that expensive to use and you know that's going to keep that meat in pristine condition in the, you know the vacuum bag but you know by all means you know you're going to want to handle that meat just like you would if you were getting meat from the grocery store you don't just throw a pound of hamburger in the bed of your pickup truck right, right. <laughs> and drive down the road on some misty November night with you know roads, <laughs> road salt and fog and everything getting on it. So you want to protect that meat because, you know, it's a, a good way for you to you know, supplement your diet and you just as well, you know, take good care of that meat mm-hmm. so that it's going to be palatable, not only for you, but for your kids and your family, your guests, your wife, your girlfriend, whoever you're going to serve it to. Sure. And I, I think even taking that a, a step further is is the breathability of, of trash bags. Certainly, you know, if, if you're looking at, at, you know, a Western style of hunting, it's very common to quarter the animal out and bring it back in quarters. And there's I, I've had some questions over the years of people trying that with trash bags. Um, my, my thought process has always been that that's probably not the, the best and, and easiest way to cool off that meat because you're just trapping a lot of that moisture in there. It's not allowing it to breathe. Would you agree with that? Or, or? Right. Most of the time, if you're, you've got, you know, bigger cuts like that, they'll use game bags, you know, that are breathable. Um, you still want to get, you know, unless it's real cold outside, you want to get some ice in there and get that, that uh, meat cooled down. I've seen people you know, have those sleds that they use to drag their deer out with, those plastic sleds. They'll have their deer laying in there and they'll put ice all over it, either in the bag or out of the bag. You know, that gets, uh, you know, gets a lot of ice on that, that deer. Uh, you can take your cuts of meat off of that animal, but you know, your quarters and things, put them in a cooler with ice, you know, that's airtight. Like, mm-hmm. You know, like you're talking about trash bags, that, but you've got all that ice in there and that's going to cool that, that carcass down. But, you know, keeping it clean and keeping it cold and using food grade packaging or, you know, clean uh, pans or clean uh, coolers or whatever you're going to be using to put that meat in, you know, that's very important to have a, you know, good, clean, good tasting, uh, wholesome product. Yeah, I think that's, you know, one thing I never really thought about when I got into hunting is the, the whole process of, of processing and, and field dressing. You really need to be cognizant of food safety the entire process. And so I, I, I do agree with that. I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. So. And it really impacts the flavor, too. It, I mean, that's, that whole gaminess to it, a lot of times, is just due from mishandling of the meat. So you want the best taste and stuff. It's the whole reason why you're out there. I mean, put the time in to do it right. And game meat. Each species, whether it's a squirrel or a rabbit, a pheasant or a deer, the, the muscle from that meat is going to have a different flavor. Sure. Some people may like it or not like it just because of whether they're used to that flavor or not. You know, they're used to something bland like chicken or mm-hmm. pork. They may not want something that has got a strong taste like a, you know, from venison or squirrel or goose or, or whatever type of game meat. But one thing that um, here in where we live here in central Illinois, where most of the deer have access to high quality protein in the form of corn and soybeans and, uh, you know, the, the fat that they put down on their body is 
not a whole lot unlike the fat that you know a, a pig or a, a steer would put down on their body so the it's not going to have a, a, a bad taste you know the fat won't so, but most people will go ahead and remove the fat anyway uh, the reason that I, I kind of bring that up is because in some areas of the country let's just say for instance you're antelope hunting out west where the uh, antelope eat a lot of sagebrush there are flavor compounds in that sage that are deposited in the fat and so it's not uncommon if you were to get an antelope and cut it up and you've got some fat on that cut of meat you're going to eat it and it's going to taste like sage Interesting. Just huh. because of the flavor compounds, the uh, flat soluble fla flavor compounds from their diet are uh, found in their in the fat, and you'll see the same thing on um, you know elk or moose or bear or anything. It you know you may have depending on their diet, you know that fat may have some some flavors that you're not you know maybe not the most pleasant or most most welcome, but if you trim that fat off. Most of the time, the, the muscle protein is going to be very good. And, and if you don't like the just the unadulterated venison type of flavor, you can marinate it. Mm -hmm. you know, you know, you, you've you got a variety of marinades that you use on you know beef steaks or chicken or whatever like that. You can marinate your wild game and uh, you know cover up any gaminess that you don't prefer. Sure, that. sure. Okay, so we, we've dived into to a, a couple different topics, but one thing I, I always like to, to kind of talk about and discuss with you personally is, you know, the, this idea of, of self-processing. Everybody likes to, to be involved in the process. And could you go over just some, some real basic tips and, and techniques that, that you've kind of learned over the years that that may help the, the at-home deer processor, even if they're they're just, you know, deboning the meat and they're bringing the, the you know, boneless meat to you for, for further processing. What are some of the things to, to really pay attention to? Yeah, I would say that, you know, again, you need to prepare for that handling after the harvest. You know, minimal things that you're going to need is knife or knives that are sharp. You're going to need some type of surface to cut that meat up on. And it doesn't have to be big. You know, if you've got cutting boards in your uh, kitchen that you're using either wood or plastic or whatever they're probably going to be fine for you know when you need to cut cut up your deer carcass you've got to have some you know potable water so you can make sure that your hands stay clean you know especially if you go from skinning it to cutting the deer up you, you definitely want to wash your hands before you would you know touch the meat the other thing is you really want to make sure that you've got plenty of light um, when you go to cut up that uh, carcass, you want to make sure that if there's any hair or dirt or digestive material that has gotten onto the meat during the skinning process or during that harvest process, you want to be able to see that contamination and, and trim to trim that off. Uh, the other thing is make sure that you've got your food grade packaging ready so that you can go ahead and package that meat as you uh, as you get it cut up and then when you are going to preserve that meat let's say like in the freezer make sure that you don't just stack all of that fresh meat in your freezer make sure you kind of divide it out spread it out so that it'll freeze you know quickly you know actually if you've got a refrigerator freezer the freezer on your refrigerator freezer has got a fan in there that moves the air around and it'll freeze meat faster than what a chest type deep freeze is which doesn't have any air movement so you know you might put some of your cuts of meat or bags of trim in the refrigerator freezer and some in the deep freeze or two couple deep freezes or whatever it might be uh, it's because you want to be able to to get that meat frozen you know, as quickly as you can to have the best quality product that you're going to end up with, you know, when you when you go ahead and thaw it out to to cook for your family. 
I, I, I really like that, that kind of ending note. You know, so much of us, even myself as a hunter, there's plenty of times where, you know, I've, I've spent two or three days scouting out a location, but I never even thought to, to you know, prepare for the harvest. I, I really like the way you put that. And I, I think putting it in that kind of context for, for all the listeners out there, you know, be prepared, have the, the proper equipment, but also have an understanding of, of what you're getting yourself into. Because this is, you know, the, the point in, in the, the hunt where it does become work. And so you, you do need to, to be prepared for, you know, don't don't go out in an evening where you may only have 30 minutes after after sunset before you have some kind of other time obligation, because that, that can really rush your field processing and, and how you take care of, of that animal after the harvest. Yeah, well, thank you for your time, Chuck. We yeah. appreciate it. Glad to have you. You're welcome here anytime. Excellent. Thank you. And we just wanted to extend a, a huge thank you uh, as we kind of wrap up our, our interview with Chuck Stites. Um, a huge thank you to him for, for sitting down with us today and, and talking about some of these, these kind of more, more complex and nuanced issues. But now uh, we're going to jump right into our, our hunting report. <laughs> And up first, I'm going to throw it over to, to Curtis, who's going to give us kind of an update on, on waterfowl. Yeah, thanks, Dan. So waterfowl, we're in the, the midst of the seasons now. So um, Ford's biological um, station, they were able to fly their survey on November 1st. And this is definitely a resource that I want to point out to everybody. Um, if you're on the Facebook, you can search out uh, Forbes Biological Station, or you can just look look them up on the general web. But they try to fly generally every couple of weeks in the Mississippi and Illinois River flyways and, and count all the ducks that they see. And of course, the, the moral of the story on the flight from November 1st is, is really high water. So um, we were dealing with a little bit low water in the early season and kind of hoping that we could increase our our water a little bit to open up some new habitat but uh, mother nature kind of overshot that and sent a slew of water our way that overtoppled a, a lot of the habitat that was out there so some hunters did get flooded out um, rivers got up real high now they're on the way back down so some of that habitat's kind of re-emerging but even though habitat conditions were not ideal, uh, there was about a 40% increase in the total duck numbers in the Illinois River Valley, up to around 230,000 waterfowl. Um, so there are ducks around if you can, if you can find habitat. Um, it is important to point out that that is 20% below the 10-year the average, so we might be a little bit behind the multi-year average in the Illinois River Valley, but that's made up for in the Mississippi River area, which is ahead of, that, of the 10-year average. They're approximately 48% ahead of the 10-year average in the Mississippi River area, so duck numbers have been impressive there. There are ducks around. The name of the game is, is just finding the habitat. So uh, looked at the weather here for the next 10 days. Looks like we got a little cold front coming in. And one thing that I really like to look for when I'm trying to pick out what days to duck hunt, try to find those flight days, especially um, here in Illinois where we're, we may be dealing with suboptimal habitat. Um, what we really want is new ducks, ducks that are still trying to find uh, where the food is, moving around a lot, maybe a little bit less wary. So if I find nights, which uh, waterfowl, they can migrate day and night, but they really do love to fly at night. If you get a nice night with a uh, north or my favorite would be a northwest wind, so wind coming out of the northwest 10, 15, 20 miles per hour, you can be pretty sure when you get to the marsh in the morning, there's going to be some new birds around and, and they don't know what's refuge and what's huntable and uh, any of that stuff yet. So they generally make us hunters feel a little bit better and they're my favorite kind of bird. So hopefully we'll be getting some of those in the next week. And uh, if you can find some habitat out there that's not too deep for your decoys, you should be able to get into some action out there. 
Yeah, we're 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 getting close to it, it really opening up. Now, I I know it, it wasn't in Illinois, but, but Curtis, you did get out waterfowl hunting a little bit last weekend in, in Nebraska, and it sounds like you guys had a, a pretty good hunt over there. You pick up any any kind of trends? Did you notice a certain species of ducks that that were really prominent, or was it kind of more of a, a mixed bag? Well, the biggest trend I got from Nebraska, and I hear this is true across the Dakotas as well, is it's it's uh, quite a bit drier than average. So habitat conditions are um, are suboptimal there as well. Um, so where there are habitat, it, it's filled up with ducks, and yeah, we we had to scout for an entire day until we found one place that had a decent amount of huntable water. I guess the first day we were out there, we went out into two or three marshes and couldn't find a single place where we could hide. Um, and, and with ducks, I mean, that's that's your main thing. You got to be hidden or you're not going <laughs> to yeah. not going to have a good time. So um, we were worried. We finally did find a, a piece of public land there where we had some uh, enough brush where we could hide and there was enough water and habitat the ducks wanted to be there so we got in there and, and got uh, got a limit out of there and near limit I guess my brother was dealing with some uh, shotgun issues because he for some reason he went away from the old trusty 870 like me the, the <laughs> never fail and uh, you know there he was pulling his trigger and his gun not going off so maybe he'll learn his lesson and, yeah. and switch switch back to the old Remington but um, yeah I think the moral of the story is is dry so um, the areas that do have water and food are absolutely full of ducks and it's just going to take those uh, big weather events to kind of push them down. Um, the last couple of years, the, the winters have been so mild that, you know, if ducks don't need to migrate, they don't go. You know, why would you keep going much further if you're sitting in South Dakota and flooded cornfield and, and uh, the ice or the snow hasn't pushed you down? So that's what we're going to be hoping for, hoping for some big weather up there in, in the Dakotas and Nebraska and uh, Minnesota to, to help keep pushing all these birds down to us. Awesome. It, it sounds like, you know, just kind of looking at the, the weather for the, the upcoming, you know, next seven to 10 days, it looks like we may get a, a little bit of a cold front come through. So hopefully that that starts to, to get ducks, you know, in the in the right mood and starts pushing them down this way. Uh, but thanks for that update. Um, we'll jump right into our, our deer hunting report. Um, Adam, what, what have you got for us? Well, uh, the rut is picking up quite a bit now, um, especially as you guys just mentioned. Uh, I'm sure the ducks are going to like the cold front coming in. The deer are really going to like the cold front. Uh, we've seen a lot of uh, younger bucks moving around, chasing does. Um, haven't seen much activity out of uh, kind of the more mature buck um, side of things, but in general, deer are moving still. It's rut, whether it's 60 degrees or not, um, the deer are moving. Those are, you know, getting bumped around and, and, and bucks are trying to find their girlfriend for the next couple of weeks. So get out in the woods. It's a great time, uh, to harvest a couple deer, put them in your freezer. Um, in fact, I got lucky on another doe here last week, uh, kind of a wild story with her. Um, I shot her at 16 yards, quartering two, which isn't, uh, you know, the most ideal shot, but um, I put it where it count. I put it on her shoulder and went right through her right side lung, liver, and out the um, intestines. And it was kind of crazy. I mean, usually on a shot like that, you can expect deer to, you know, be dead within 200, 250 yards. Yeah, well, especially if you get that 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 lung like it sounds like you got. Yep, yep. And uh, yeah, crazy story. She, We found her the next day a thousand yards away and Whew. still alive um, after 17 hours. So it just shows how, how strong these animals are and their will to survive is crazy. Um, so we had to put another shot on her to, uh, you know, exp let her expire. And uh, yeah, but we did end up recovering her. And good story. Unfortunately, wish she, you know, expired a little sooner. Uh, but again, it's, you know, when you're hunting, it doesn't always go perfect. And it just, you got to stay determined and, and put in the time to find the animal after you shoot, even if it's not an ideal shot. Sure, sure. Mm -hmm. 
Well, congrats on the harvest, but yeah, yeah. Th- those, those quartering two shots, they, they always seem to, you know, just never hit the, the internal vitals. Like you think they're, they're going to, I don't know if it's, you know, a slight deflection off that front shoulder, depending how they have that, that, you know, that front shoulder, if their front foot's kind of tucked in underneath them, or if they're kind of, you know, taking that next step where it opens up that, that pocket of vitals a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. There's lots of variables and uh, you know, of course, always try to get that broadside or quartering away shot, but it doesn't always happen that way, but sure. Sure. Yep. So just got to, Stay patient and stay stay on top of it. Yeah, and I, I've been out quite a bit the the past few days here or past few weeks here, I guess. Um, what I've what I've really noticed is, and and I think a, a lot of it is probably some of the the temperatures that we had, you know, the the past few days. Right, it did you know warm up to getting kind of the the upper to mid sixties. And I checked a few of my trail cameras um, last weekend, and it seems like a lot of the the especially the the buck activity is, is still a lot of times during the, the nocturnal hours. And so I think, you know, this cold front that's supposed to come through into, you know, November 12th through kind of the, the 20th, it looks like we're going to get a little bit of a, of a relief from the warmth and, and see some, some dropping temperatures. I think that's, that's really going to really going to kick up that, that buck activity, particularly during, during daylight hours. But my strategy is still again, focusing on, on those downwind side of, of doe bedding areas, as well as any transition areas from, from bedding to, to feeding. And one thing I've noticed, and I don't, I don't know if you guys have, have noticed this either, but a lot of the, the crops are, are out of the ground, but there is still quite a bit of beans standing. And I, I've seen quite a bit of deer still feeding in, in these agricultural fields. And I, I thought at this point, they'd probably start transitioning, you know, into the, the, the mast crop. We, we had such a good acorn crop this year. I thought we'd see, you know, a quicker transition into those food sources. But I guess with just the, the way the weather was and, and how harvest went for a lot of the, the farmers, there is still some, some standing ag in, in lots of places. And I, I think that is, that's also impacting, you know, feeding and, and stuff like that. So definitely keep that in mind. If you're out and about, even if the, the property you're on, you know, doesn't have standing crops, if it's adjacent, chances are there, there's deer using it. And so just kind of keep that in mind. Again, even if it's not on the property that you're hunting, that can still, you know, impact where deer are feeding and how they're kind of, you know, maneuvering through and through an area. Oh, for sure. Yeah. I always try to keep an eye out on a landscape, on the landscape as a whole, not just focused on the piece of property that I'm hunting, but it's always important to look around, you know, uh, the whole area and see, um, you know, like you just mentioned, if the crops are in, if they're out, um, just keep an eye out on what's going on around the property because that dictates the movement of deer on the property itself as well a lot of times. So, yeah, very good point right there. Yeah, and I, I again, I, I think in the next few days we're, we're really going to see an uptick in, in that, that you know, daylight activity of some of these, these bigger mature bucks. Um, but we actually shared a, a video on our, our Instagram page. Um, a, a friend sent it to me. He's got some security cameras around his house. And there's actually this pretty, pretty nice mature buck that comes walking through and he's got, you know, probably a three foot gap between his, his garage and the side of his house. And that buck just cruised right through there, you know, at, at two o'clock in the morning. And, and so I, I think a lot of it, again, is still on kind of that, that nocturnal pattern. But as the, the testosterone levels are starting to peak in these bucks this time of year, I think they're going to, they're going to really start letting their guard down here uh, the next few days and, and really start, you know, trying to breed does. And I think you're going to see again, that, that uptick in, in daylight activity. And it really corresponds well with this incoming, you know, cool, fr- I don't want to really call it a cold front, um, but kind of a, a cool front. And I, I think the, the next week or two are going to be, be really exciting to, to be in the deer woods. Oh yeah. Like Anybody with uh... normal temperatures front. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anybody with a gun tag coming up, what is that next weekend? Um, right. You know, on the 19th of November, it starts, they're going to be, they're going to be in them for sure. Yeah. That, it, it's going to be a, a good weekend to, to be out there. So if you did, yeah, if you did draw a firearm tag, I, I think it's shaping up to be a, a pretty good uh, firearm season overall. And, and just kind of to, to piggyback, you know, we're still in this, this deer report. Um, obviously we, we had this, this interview with Chuck is kind of the, the bulk of the, the podcast. Um, and we, we just kind of listened to that, but one thing that, that he brought up and, and, it, it is evident in looking at some of the harvest trends on a, on a county to county basis from, from year to year, there is a, a pretty drastic decline in the overall deer harvest 
um, from where we are, you know, right now to, to where we were at this point last year. And again, I think there's, there's probably a lot of variables at play there. Obviously last year, a lot of things were shut down. So a lot of people had more time to, to be out in the woods, probably did a little bit more scouting. Um, this year was a little bit seasonably warm and everything's, you know, kind of getting back in the swing of things. Everything's opening back up. And so maybe there, there's less pressure. But I, I bring that up just to say that, you know, if you haven't had much success yet at this point in the season, we still have a, a ton of deer season left. And, and things are really, you know, just starting to, to really crank open with, with rut. Um, so don't be discouraged. Um, there, there's, there's still a lot of deer on the landscape. And, and if you keep putting in the time and the effort and the energy, um, you'll you'll eventually put your yourself in a position to to have success. But with nope. that, oh, go ahead. Nope. Sorry, I'm just going to say, don't forget if you get uh, really tired of the deer game, you can always stop it and do something fun, like go duck hunting or squirrel. Exactly. Hunting. <laughs> yep, yep. Which which kind of leads us leads us right into our small game report. Um, so this is where we're going to talk of, about squirrel, rabbit, um, upland bird a little bit. Um, so, so things have, have really started to, to open up. Obviously, um, last week we just saw, our, or last weekend we just saw our opening of a pheasant and quail season. So that was November sixth. Um, <coughs> excuse me. I haven't personally gotten out yet in the in the, the pheasant field, but one of the the public sites that I deer hunt um, has a, has a pretty substantial uh, kind of prairie. Um, on it and there's quite a bit of pheasant hunters out there over the weekend and I heard lots of shots lots of shooting um, I, I talked to quite a few people in the parking lot and they're they are, are seeing lots of birds um, sounds like we're, we're going to have a, a decent year and, uh, last episode we did look into the the pheasant status report that Illinois DNR puts out every year that kind of looks at nesting success looks at precipitation events and how that can impact, um, you know, overall population trends. Um, and that report did think that we would see an uptick in the, the pheasant population, either stable or, or kind of a, a slight uptick. And it, it sounds like we're, we're kind of seeing that. So it's going to be a great year for, for pheasant hunting, I think, as long as the, the, the weather holds off. But again, find the habitat and find the birds. That, that's kind of the real name of the, the game for, for upland birds is focusing on on finding the, the correct suitable habitat. Um, and obviously with, with pheasants and quail, there's not a ton of habitat on the landscape. So when you find the, those areas that do have it, um, you, can, you can have a, a pretty good hunt normally. Uh, but I also do want to mention the, the controlled pheasant hunting program, if that's something you're interested in. Um, essentially, that is a program that's run through Illinois DNR on some of their state sites where they do uh, controlled pheasant hunts. So you can show up that day, um, pay, pay a set fee, and, and go out and, and hunt that hunt those birds that, that were released. Um, so again, that, that's entirely up to you, but there are roughly about a dozen sites across the state that, that have controlled pheasant hunting. So if you get on DNR's website and go to the, the pheasant hunting tab, you can, you can look up there, but it's a great option uh, to, to at least get out and get yourself, you know, familiar with, with pheasant hunting if you've never done it before, or maybe you're just struggling to find, you know, good quality habitat that actually holds birds. Um, that, that can be a, a great way to, to at least get some hunting experience, get some hunting exposure. Um, I try to do it once every year. I'll probably do it here um, in the next week or to Adam and I were actually talking about it uh, last weekend, just to again get some of the kinks worked out with the dogs, get the dogs comfortable, get them them feeling the hunt before we start chasing some of the, the wild birds. So again, um, if that's something you're interested in, I, I definitely recommend um, looking into it. But now we'll dive into to squirrel, and squirrel is, I, I, I hate saying it, but this time of year is honestly one of my favorite times of, of year to squirrel hunt. It, it's really difficult to convince myself to go squirrel hunting because obviously it, it's deer rut. Um, but anybody who's been out in the, the deer stand the past few days has probably seen a, a pretty substantial uptick in the amount of squirrel activity, um, squirrels chasing. Um, and, and so it, it's a great time to, to get out and squirrel hunt if, if you're interested. Um, I'm still focused on finding the, those mast crops, so finding those areas that have high densities of, of hickories and high densities of oaks. Um, now, what I, I will say is this has been kind of an unusual year in terms of leaf fall or leaf off, I should say. Um, there's still lots of trees holding a substantial amount of leaves. I, I have noticed the past few days I've had to rake several times already. So I think they're finally starting to, to drop at a, a decent pace. And that's really what I, what I personally look for uh, for squirrel hunting. I, I find it very difficult to hunt squirrels when there's so many leaves on the trees that you're just not really seeing that many squirrels. I like to wait till right about now when the leaves are starting to fall off, temperatures are, are starting to drop. So you know you're gonna have that early morning activity. So I would focus again 
on areas that have mast trees. So hickories, oaks, and try to find those cool mornings with very low wind. Um, and, and I think doing those strategies in the next, you know, two, three, four weeks, I think you'll, you'll be in pretty good shape this, this time of year. I got to say the last couple of times I've been in the deer stand, I wish I was sitting there with a shotgun because there's so many squirrels running around that it was almost getting to the point where it was driving me crazy because I couldn't hear anything else moving. Yeah. I actually, uh, one of my friends was out, out squirrel hunting or out deer hunting last night. And he texted me a picture of a squirrel kind of ran into his lap. I don't think the, the squirrel ever knew he was there. Um, he was just sitting on the ground and the squirrel just ran up and kind of sat there right on his lap. <laughs> wow. Yeah. They are definitely active and it's definitely, if you, if you were lucky enough to get a couple deer in the freezer already and had time to focus on squirrels, now is definitely the time. Much easier to drag out of the woods. That yes. it is. That it is. That is true. <laughs> well, that concludes kind of our, our hunting report, but now we're going to take a look at, at last week's critter trivia question. So, Curtis, what, what have you got for us? Yeah, so last week, our critter trivia question of the podcast, we asked, what species of migratory bird that commonly nest in Illinois rebounded with the help of artificial nest boxes in the last 30 years? And the answer is wood duck. Well, a sponsor, one of the one of the most colorful ducks we've got across the landscape and one of the most common ducks to to actually nest in Illinois. So if you do got a piece of ground with a little wetland, a little stream, a little pond, um, think about putting up an artificial wood duck nesting box and um, help the critters out. They do use them at a pretty high rate. Also, you'll sometimes see hooded mergansers use them and sometimes even owls. So pretty cool little nifty nest boxes. They've done a done a great job. The wood duck was uh, not doing so great after some of the floods of the early 90s, and they lost a lot of their, their uh, trees with natural cavities. But um, the nest boxes have been super successful, and now wood duck is generally the second most common duck in the bag across most of the, the Mississippi flyway. So pretty cool. That is cool. And, and, you know, most people have probably seen a wood duck nesting box. Even if you, you weren't familiar with what it looks like, um, you, you'll find them very often on, on, like Curtis mentioned, on some of these public sites. Um, if you're ever at a public site and it's got, you know, a little pond or a, a, a decent sized lake, you'll, you'll see kind of wood, wooden, they basically just look like wooden birdhouses that are, you know, roughly three feet off of the, the water surface. Um, and that's what, what he's referring to. So you do commonly see him on, on DNR sites. And it's always cool to just kind of sit there and watch. And, and very commonly you'll, you'll see, you know, little ducklings if you're at the, the right time of year, you know, come, come falling out of there. <laughs> oh yeah. There's, there's nothing like watching a cute little fluff ball of a baby duck jump out of a nest for the <laughs> yeah. first time. Uh, <laughs> Uh, it, you know, it, you got to be exact on your, um, cause they, they basically only do it once. So it's yep. hard to catch, but if you're, if you got some free time and you want to put a smile on your face, you just Google up, um, uh, I think it's actually like buffle heads that generally do this up in the Pacific Northwest, but, uh, they do put nest cameras on them and actually film when the, when the babies jump out and they come tumbling out of there, you know, just, just like, a a stone and bounce off the ground <laughs> yeah. and get up walking and it's it's impossible to have a bad day watching that i tell you what oh well thanks curtis yeah and now for the critter trivia question of this podcast we are asking you what species of tree squirrels can you find in illinois Ooh bonus I'll, I'll throw out a bonus too bonus if you can list the the name of species and which ones are legal to hunt mm. delicious little tree squirrel so think about that and we'll we'll talk about the answer on the next podcast mm -hmm.